Good morning. Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church. Turn in your hymnal 655. Let's all stand as we sing, please. Hymn 655. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than clouds in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my those around you. Sixty-nine. Sound the battle cry. Five hundred and sixty-nine. Sound the battle cry. See the foe is nigh. Raise the standard high for the Lord. Urge your honor on. Stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon. Holy work, rounds and soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, for shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Song to meet the foe, marching on we go, while our cause we know must prevail. Gleaming in the light, battling for the right we ne'er can fail. Rouse and soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throne. Oh, thou God of the hear us when we come, help us. One and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, may we wear the crown before thy face. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throne. Let's go ahead and open up this morning in a word of prayer. Brother Mark, would you open us in prayer this morning? Amen. You may be seated. All right, just a couple announcements. Want to mention this Friday um, we're gonna be having a homeschool trip to Tanner's Orchard. So if you have any questions about that, want to see my wife, uh, that's out about an hour and a half from here, out by Peoria, and uh, we take our family there every year. It's always a real good time if you've ever been there. It's a apple orchard, corn maze, 
a big player for the kid, but uh, kids, it's a, a good good time. That will be this Friday, and then Saturday, this coming Saturday, we're going to be having a bonfire at the Gomer's house, and uh, what time is that? Five. Five, Five o'clock uh, is when that will begin. If you could bring a dish to pass, uh, that'd be great, and then October 5th, we'll be having the Solning Marathon in Idaville, Indiana, uh, at the uh, with the ancient landmark Baptist Church there so if you like to be a part of that that is October 5th I think those are all the announcements I wanted to mention so let's go ahead and say our monthly memory verse together first Corinthians 6 19 through 20 let's say it together what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which ye have of God and ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. All right, that's all the announcements. Any birthdays this week? Any birthdays, anniversaries? Didn't check for that. All right, then. Well, let's go ahead then and have another song. Turn to hymn 438. We'll sing all three verses on Jordan Stormy Banks, 438. On Jordan Stormy Banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land come and we will receive this morning's offering. <clears throat> Brother Lon, you ask a blessing?
for the offertory and for the last hymn before the message. 575, we'll sing the first and last verse. So I'll stand to sing 575. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong. He will protect you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your God. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice for the victory is yours. Listening to the music there just sound real good. It reminded me of something I forgot to announce. So um, we're wanting to start uh, doing like a practice maybe once in a month with different instruments to have during the congregational singing. So if you play an instrument and would be interested in that, let me know after the service. We're uh, talking about maybe once a month on Sunday nights before service, uh, possibly doing a practice for hymns. And we're wanting to uh, especially kind of kick this off when we get into the Christmas season. We're wanting to start working on the Christmas songs early and uh, get some brass or woodwinds, whatever whatever we've got. So if that's something you'd be interested in participating in, let me know. And I know we've got a few brass right now, uh, and so if we could maybe get some woodwinds added in there too. So I don't know. I want to make sure that we're not uh, missing out on some you know, talent that's in the audience. So uh, if you've got it uh, and be interested in that, just let me know after the service and uh, we'll probably be announcing a time real soon and we'll begin that. So right now though, let's go ahead and uh, we're gonna go to our scripture reading right now. And uh, Brother West is gonna come and we're gonna be in John chapter, I don't have my notes in front of me. I think it's John chapter 16, he knows what it is. So go ahead and come on Brother West. Okay, we're going to be reading in John chapter 16, if you'd like to follow along. <clears throat> These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you as the, in the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whether goest thou? <clears throat> but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, and if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the word of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot hear them, bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall speak of himself 
But whatsoever ye shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he should take of mine, and shall show you unto him, show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of what I said? A little while, and ye shall not see me, and a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. As a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she has delivered the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye, know, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall, be, shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give, of, give it of you. Hither, <clears throat> hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because he hath loved me, and hath believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come unto the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo now, speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb? Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou comest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcometh the world. <clears throat> Amen. All right, look at what it says in verse 7 of John chapter 16. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. What I'm going to be preaching on this morning is the subject of Holy Ghost Conviction. Holy Ghost Conviction. Now, I did a post this week uh, on Facebook, and it was kind of an experimental thing that I was doing. And uh, there was kind of, there was, there, was a, a, there was a reasoning behind this. And this is what the post said that I did. I said, since so many Baps are teaching that you can't get saved without Holy Ghost conviction, I would appreciate it if you could give me some scriptures that prove this. I don't think that's asking too much. I also need you to define Holy Ghost conviction with the scriptures. And then I said, no comments on this post, only scriptures. I'm working on uh, a message on this subject. Now, that didn't happen, all right? Okay, people, uh, when it comes to this subject, they, they can't just leave scriptures. And obviously, that did not happen. Comments were left on there, too, uh, which I was pretty sure was going to happen. But that was also to illustrate a point. Okay? And everything that I expect to happen, in fact, every verse... I was, I was in a restaurant when I posted this, and I told my wife, I was like, here's the scriptures people are going to use. And the main one I knew was John 16, 7 through 11. That guy posted several people put that down. And the thing is, the way I worded this too, I think it you know, aggravated some people. 
You know, I, I mean, I, of course, I got accused of downplaying the work of the Holy Spirit, which I was not. But here's the thing. When it comes to this subject of Holy Ghost conviction, I do believe in Holy Ghost conviction. I believe it is a real thing. I believe it is biblical. I believe there is Bible to prove, prove it. I believe that the Bible that they used to prove Holy Ghost conviction was accurate. However, here's where my problem is. Preachers, they get up in church and they will mention Holy Ghost conviction. They will read the proper scriptures about Holy Ghost conviction, but then they will proceed to talk about something that doesn't even resemble Holy Ghost conviction. That is not Holy Ghost conviction. And then what they go on to describe is not in the Bible. And that's why I wanted people to you know, define Holy Ghost conviction for me with the scriptures. Because when you define it with the scriptures, you're going to see it does not even resemble what people are talking about today. So I'm not, uh, I'm not one of these that does not believe in Holy Ghost conviction. I get convicted by the Holy Ghost on a regular basis. I, I, I absolutely believe in it. I experience it all the time. But I'm telling you what some preachers are preaching about today is not Holy Ghost conviction. So what I want to do right now in this message, I'm going to show you first off what Holy Ghost conviction is biblically. And then I'm going to talk about what is being uh, you know, presented as Holy Ghost conviction that is not Holy Ghost conviction. Time to go ahead and turn that down a little bit. It's still buzzing in the speaker a little bit. But uh, first off, that word convict all right, or conviction or convicted, that, part, that, that, that word is only found in the Bible one time. Okay? And, and they do. They make a huge deal. They will get up. They'll get up and tell people. They'll preach things like no conviction, no conversion. And I, on one hand, I believe no conviction, no conversion. But what they preach in their no conviction, no conversion, I do not agree with at all. In fact, I, I probably would not say that 99% of messages no, about no conviction, no conversion are absolute heresy. Okay, so let me, but first of all, let's look at the only time that word is used in the Bible. In John 8, 9, this is after the woman is taken in adultery. After Jesus said, he's the, without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. It says, and when they that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. Okay, so right there we see people convicted, but it was by their conscience. Was it, by, it wasn't by the Holy Ghost. They were convicted by their conscience. That's the only time you can see that in the Bible. So the thing is, if you're going to go around, you know, saying that Holy Ghost you can't get saved without Holy Ghost conviction, you better define that, and you better be able to show people clearly from the Scriptures what that actually means, because that's a pretty big thing. If I'm required to have something in order to be saved, you better be able to explain to me very clearly what that is. But you know what? These people they can't explain it clearly. They are all over the place. They contradict themselves like crazy when they talk about Holy Ghost conviction. And I'm going to show you that in this message. And anybody who would, what I'm going to, would say that I'm exaggerating on anything I say today has been living under a rock and they've not been in Baptist churches. I'm not up here today to exaggerate or even to make fun, even though I intend to make fun. Okay? It's, it's just the reality of the situation. This kind of preaching has got to stop and it's at least got to be called out. So, first off, uh, you know, when, so when, when you try to straighten people out on this and you try to tell them, hey, what you're talking about, that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, that has nothing to do with salvation, they will try to accuse you of downplaying the role of the Holy Spirit. But the problem with the average preacher when it comes to this subject is that it's not that they're all full-blown heretics, even though some of them are. The problem is they are not clear on, the su on this subject. They go and they get up talking about Holy Ghost conviction tell you, if you never had it, you're not really saved. And then people are out in the audience like, well, have I had it? Because a lot of times their experience wasn't exactly like theirs and the, the audience is often left confused. The congregation doesn't know what's going on. And we're seeing it today. I see it all the time where people who grew up in church, grew up in preacher's homes, people who went through Bible college are getting saved after that. And then they're saying, well, I, I never really meant it. I'm like, really? You, you didn't really believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again? You didn't believe that if you asked him to forgive you of your sins that he'd save you? You didn't believe that? Is that what you're telling me? Are you saying, you, or you just, did you just not really think it was true? Did you think it was a fairy tale? You know, what was it? 
Well, no, I, you know, I prayed and everything, but you know, I just I didn't really mean it. Okay, so you prayed not thinking he would save you. You didn't believe that him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. You didn't believe that passage, or do you mean I didn't mean it when I said I was willing to give up all my sins? That's because that's what they really are saying. And if that's what they're saying, and if that's what they tried doing that last time they got saved, supposedly, they're still not saved. And I'm telling you right now, these people, I mean, young preacher's kids, I think you're, I mean, I've never done the statistics on this, but I think your average preacher kid's probably been saved and baptized seven times. I'm not lying. I'm, I'm not lying on that. I'm not exaggerating. That's just the reality of it. And it's because of all this junk they're hearing, hearing preached, sometimes from their own fathers. In many cases, but definitely in a lot of the preachers conferences and camp meetings and things they go to, they are hearing this trash preached. And so let me briefly show you what Holy Ghost conviction is. And and then we'll, you know, we'll have some fun with the heretics. All right. But in John 16, verse seven, because this is all the passages I'm going to use. I'm not going to use any scriptures in this message that were not given to me on Facebook. OK, I'm not I'm only going to use the ones that were given. I'm not going to use all of them. Some of them just weren't even close to talking about anything. They had to do with the Holy Spirit. I was like, really? <laughs> but uh, you know, some of them were legit. This one is one where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Okay. Now notice the job of the Holy Spirit. One is to reprove the world of sin. Now what does reprove mean? It means to correct, okay? He's going to show people that they're a sinner. The Holy Ghost, it reveals to us that we are sinful. The Holy Ghost, it reveals to us that we are transgressors of the law. It convicts us, okay? Now, what does that word convict mean? Because I will say some of the people who posted, too, on Facebook and who went on to add some of their own words, they actually nailed it. Okay, they actually got it dead on. Not everybody that was on there was just an idiot and a buffoon. No, some, some guys got this figured out, some of the pastors that commented on there. But a uh, definition of conviction, it's the act of proving, finding, or determining to be guilty of an offense charged against a person before a legal tribunal and by confession, by the verdict of a jury, or by the sentence of other tribunal, as in the summary of convictions, before commissioners of the revenue. So notice, if you go, if you're on trial and a jury determines that you are guilty, okay, they will convict you. Okay? They are basically declaring you guilty. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Does he not declare us guilty? And in order for someone to get saved, do they not have to admit their guilt? Yes, they do. You do have to admit your guilt. And it's the Holy Spirit that reveals that guilt to us. Now, how does the Holy Spirit reveal guilt to us? He reveals guilt to us, one, by the Word of God, and also through soul winners who are using the Word of God. What do we do? We go and we, reach, we show them the Scriptures. We show them that they are a sinner, that they are a transgressor of the law, and that there is a penalty for that sin. And you know what we do? We try to tell people that that penalty for sin, it's a place called hell. But you know what? Jesus Christ... He paid that penalty for us. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died on our behalf. And if you'll believe on him, you can have eternal life. That's what we try to tell them. But in order for them to get saved, they do have to be convinced or convicted of their guilt. And understand, the Holy Ghost does that. The Holy Ghost has convicted the entire world of guilt. Now, but here's what conviction is not necessarily so bad okay now there's been times i've been pulled over by the police and i was convinced i was guilty okay i was you know i was convicted of my guilt there was no doubt in my mind that i had transgressed the law and i had been caught speeding okay now did i feel bad about it you know i mean uh, i felt bad i got caught you know but at the same time i was definitely convicted you know, and by myself, I knew. But then sometimes the police was, you know, he convicted me too, and he wrote me a ticket. And he told me, hey, you're guilty. And I've never even bothered fighting any of my tickets in court because I was usually guilty uh, when I got all my tickets. But uh, at the same, you know, the Holy Spirit does that. He's, you know, he's, he convicts the whole world, okay? Everyone who is lost, 
Okay, when the when the gospel is given to them, they know whether or not they're guilty. They know that. But you know what many of them don't do? They don't choose to believe on Christ. They do not accept his payment for their sin. They would rather try to just work their own way to heaven. And they're not willing to just believe the gospel. Many times they just don't believe that if they would just believe on him, they'd be saved. They don't believe that. You know, and the reason for that is because they don't think their sins are that bad. You know, they know they're sinful, but they're not, they're not convinced they're as bad as people are saying they are. And they just choose to not accept the gospel. And, the, and John says it's because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light lest their deeds should be reproved, okay, corrected. And the Holy Spirit does that. He corrects people. He shows them their guilt. And we all would agree that nobody's going to get saved who doesn't believe they're a sinner. And it's very clear in the Bible, the Holy Ghost, he convinces people of their sin. He reproves the world of sin. He will show us that we are guilty. James 2.10. Uh, this is a verse that someone gave uh, you know, to prove this point. James 2.10. Let me find it. I can't find it in my notes. I'm going to have to turn there. Go ahead and turn over to James chapter 2 and verse 10. But it, <clears throat> it says, a sin... It's just a transgression of the law. It says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So you all see that right there? You offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of the whole law. You say, oh, I've never killed anybody. Okay, but if you've stolen, then you've broken the law. If you, well, I never stole anything. Well, have you ever told a lie? Well, if you told a lie, then you've broken the law. You are a lawbreaker. There's no doubt about that. And then in Romans chapter 3, go ahead and turn over Romans chapter 3 and verse 18. Look what it says here. It says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we see that the, you know, the world, it needs to become guilty before God. And they're guilty of what? Of breaking the law. They're guilty of that. The Holy Ghost was sent to show people that. To, and the thing is, it, we do need the help of the Holy Spirit when we're witnessing to people. Because it's not enough for many people to just see the words, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's got to be a work on the heart, too, where they believe in their heart. And we can't necessarily, you know, see the heart in many cases. In fact, we, we can't see the heart, period. We can only see the outside, but it is the Holy Spirit that does a work there. And we can't see how that works. We can't see what all's going on. But there's no doubt he's a part. And he will, he will show us what we need to do. And notice in John chapter 16... In John chapter 16, all these people's favorite verse that shows that the, whole, the comfort is going to come and he's going to reprove the world of sin. Why? Because you all, you ain't going to get saved unless you're willing to repent of all your sins. You know, that's why some of you aren't saved. Y'all just got up and you said a prayer and yet you kept on living just like you did the day before. You're all still sinful. You haven't been willing to give up that sin and you think the Holy Spirit saved you? Man, the Bible says when he comes, he's going to convict. He's going to reprove the world of sin. But notice what the sin is that he reproves the world of. It's not sin in general. It says of sin. Look what it says. It says he will reprove the world of sin because they believe not on me. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that. Here's the sin that the Holy Spirit is going to reprove the world of, of sin because they believe not on me. This is in John. Okay? that is written so we would believe on him. This is in the Gospel of John. It's funny, the Gospel of John, where their main verses where they get verses about the Holy Ghost conviction and things, doesn't use the word repent anywhere in the book. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't ever talk about repenting of your sins. It just says over and over again, believe on Christ, believe on Christ, believe on Christ. And here's the thing, when the Holy Spirit actually does convict you of your sin and convinces you are a sinner, 
you're not going to be dumb enough to think that you can repent of your sins in order to receive salvation. You know what it's going to do? It's going to tell you, my only hope is Jesus Christ because I can't repent of my sins. I can't be good enough. Even if I give up my drinking, I've still got all these other sins. I mean, I, even if I quit all the outward things, I still sin on the inside. I still sin from the heart because in my body dwelleth no good thing. My flesh, it's dirty. It's corrupt. I'm a wretched man. And the Holy Ghost is going to convince people of that. And so you know what he's going to get people to do? He's not going to convince people. You, you know what you need to do? You just need to start living a better life. You know what you need to do? You need to go up to that old fashioned altar and you need to lay them cigarettes down on the altar and then you'll be, you know, then you'll get saved. And I've heard stories of preachers doing, you know, I mean, that, that's like when they got saved. And I was going to let them cigarettes, I wasn't going to let them cigarettes take me to hell. You know, and so really, you have to give up your cigarettes to go to heaven? Yeah. And then you never know, you know, and they'll say things, I, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe everybody that smokes is going to go to hell. They're just going to smell like they've already been there, you know, and just, you know, the, so wait a minute, do, do I have to give these things up to go to heaven? I, I don't know if I can you know, and, and the thing is, everybody's just out there wondering. And it sounds real good because, you know, we all want everybody to give up the smoke. We don't want to smell it. But at the same time, does that actually save somebody? You know, I, I, I can tell you right now, I know the Holy Ghost never let me do that. Well, maybe he wouldn't. But, you know, I don't, I don't think he wants anybody to do it. But sometimes people don't listen. You know, how is God supposed to chasten whom he loves if we're never disobedient? How are we supposed to be proven that we are sons by his chastening if we never do anything wrong? Do you all see how these things they say, they make no sense. There's, just, there's no clarity in what they're preaching at all. And I'm not trying to make light of sin. But the Holy Ghost, he is, he's going to reprove the world of sin. Of sin, because they believe not on me. He's going to reprove the world of righteousness. Why does he need to do that? Well, I believe since Jesus is not physically here, you know, the Holy Spirit, he guides us towards righteousness we don't have jesus in the flesh to show us the way but notice how it says it says of righteousness because i go to my father and ye see me no more okay and what people will do say he they'll take that verse and say he's going to reprove you of righteous in other words he's just going to be all over you and getting on all your sins and he does do that sometimes but that's not what it's talking about in this passage it says he's going to reprove the world of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. You know what we need? We need an example of righteousness. We need an example of that which is holy. And unfortunately, we're not it. We should try to be an example of it. But ultimately, you know what the best example of holiness is that we have on this earth that we should follow after? That is the Holy Spirit. We should follow His lead. And don't be afraid to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal sin that's in your life he will do it and he will guide you into all truth and it'll help you get right he will reprove the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged he is going to help make it clear that there is in fact judgment coming for sin there are some people when we give them the gospel they will admit that they are sinners they'll admit that They'll say that they believe on Christ, you know, that they believe Jesus died for them and all that stuff. But you know what? They'll often say, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe Jesus would send anybody to hell. Well, if they don't believe in hell, then they have not been reproved of judgment by the Holy Ghost. They're not going to get saved if they do not believe in the punishment of sin. If they're not going to believe for the wages of sin is death, they're not going to be saved. Even if they say they believe in the death of Jesus Christ, because the whole point of Jesus' death is he died in our place. He took our punishment for us. And so then for you to say, I don't believe in any eternal punishment, then why do you even believe on Je the, you know, the death of Jesus Christ? They're denying the death of Jesus Christ. When, when they deny hell because of the fact that they are denying eternal punishment. And the Holy Ghost, He will reprove the world of that. He will let them see that. And you know, our world knows deep down inside that judgment is coming. But you know what they've done? They have blinded their eyes to it. They have stayed in darkness because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want their deeds being reproved so the Holy Spirit, he uses those two, you know, he uses really two things. He uses the word of God 
and he uses God's people. So basically, I believe Holy Ghost conviction it is accomplished when the Holy Spirit uses God's word or a messenger of God's word to convince the sinners that they are guilty and in need of a Savior. Now, many people respond to Holy Ghost conviction very differently. I mean, on a massive scale, all right? Some, you know, and look, this is not a trick question, okay? People respond differently. People react differently when they get saved. But how many will admit, you know, Brother Tommy, when I got saved, I cried. Would you raise your hand? All right, raise your hand if when you got saved, you cried, all right? I see, I see several hands that cried, okay? Now, not everybody, how many did not cry when they got saved, okay? Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> But wait a minute, wait a minute, everyone's different, okay? A, a lot of people, you know, when you're a little kid, you know, a lot of times you're not going to get real emotional. You just come as a child. Isn't that what Jesus said to do? Remember the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair and with her tears? Remember, why did she do that? She had been forgiven much. But there were others, they hadn't been forgiven as much, so they didn't show as much gratitude. They didn't show as much emotion. Folks, there's a huge, there's a huge range of reactions that you're going to get from people. You know, most of the hands, and I'm not picking on anybody, okay? But most of the hands that went up on the crying end were women. Why? They're typically more emotional people, okay? Now, maybe some of the men that raised your hand, maybe it was because you got forgiven a whole lot of stuff. And it did it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's going to be a difference, but what's happening today is preachers are getting up and they're comparing everyone's experience to their experience and then saying, you didn't have Holy Ghost conviction. I don't know how the Holy Ghost can get all over you and you not shed a tear. Something wrong with that. But wait a minute, is that, can you, can you show me where Holy Ghost conviction means I'm shedding a tear? Because I'm not seeing that. Anywhere in the Bible. Some people rejoice. Some people just get excited when they find out, well, salvation is a free gift. I've been working for this my whole life. I've been trying to do all these sacraments. I've been trying to be good. And now I can, and I still don't know if I'm saved. I got to worry about it all the time. And you're telling me that it's just a free gift. Some people just get excited and they get overjoyed. Some people are, and it's funny, people like to bring up the woman at the well. Boy, Jesus got all over her about her sin. You know, basically, they'll use her as proof you have to repent of your sins. But I don't see where Jesus told her she had to repent of her sin to be saved. I see where he showed her she was a sinner. But then, I don't, I, all I see her doing is getting excited about it. You know why? Because she wanted salvation too, I believe. But she felt like as a Samaritan, she didn't really know where she was going to get it from. They weren't allowed to worship in Jerusalem. They weren't allowed to do all those things. And you know what that woman did when she got saved? She ran around town telling everybody, come listen to a man that told me everything I did. Now, who does that? Okay, you know, Who goes and says, hey, this person knows everything about me. Come, you know, that's, you know, most of us, we hide him from that person. But she didn't care. She was just excited. She was happy finding out that she could have this water of life freely. You know, in a world where she was not allowed to go to Jerusalem, where she was not allowed to worship because of how she was born, to find out that I can freely have this water of life, it thrilled her heart, and she just went and started telling people about it. That There's all kinds of different reactions that you'll see even through the Bible. Some people feel really bad, but some people, they, they feel really good. Some may... You know, some people might not want a light being shined on their sins, though, because their deeds are evil. Some people, when they are reproved of sin, they reject in full blasphemy. Many times end up becoming reprobate. But the bottom line is no two people are alike when it comes to how they react. And preachers need to stop trying to make everyone who didn't you know, have an identical experience to them think they're not saved. They're causing confusion. And I'm tired of seeing this where kids who grew up in church getting baptized so many times, getting saved over and over again. It's like an annual of youth conference event, going and getting saved again. That is not right. There's something wrong when that happens. We shouldn't be rejoicing when that happens. We should be asking, where did we go wrong? When, we're, when our people in our church are getting saved over and over again, when we know that you can't lose your salvation. There's something wrong with that. So we all now we all understand holy conviction, you know what it is. You know, let's look at some of the false teaching that often comes 
with this subject. And let's look at the scriptures they misuse. So first off, look at what it says in John 6, 44 and 45. John 6, 44 and 45. Now, I hate to use theatrics and things like that, but, you know, sometimes you got to, to you know, to kind of get a point across. But look what it says. It says, No man could come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You all see that right there? You can't come unless he draws you. And somebody put that, it was, it was so funny because, you know, that was one of the, I, I told my wife, that's going to be one of the scriptures that get put on there. That scripture got put on there, and it was just great. Uh, you know, Brother, Brother Jamie, well, you know, and they've been here before, he immediately had to get on there, and he didn't respond, <laughs> he didn't respond with words, he just responded with scripture. I, I, it, was, it was great. I love the scripture he used. He went to John 12, 32, where it says, And if I be lifted from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This, sig this he said, signifying what death he should die. Okay, now it is true. No one can get saved unless the Holy Spirit draws them. That's true. The Bible spells that out. But you know what else the Bible says? Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, and guess what? He was when he died on the cross. He said he would draw all men unto him. So here's the thing. When you get up and you're saying, you can't get saved unless the Holy Ghost draws you. Which, you know, that's kind of a dumb thing to say because the Holy Ghost is going to draw everyone. But what they mean when they say that is right now is the time to do it. Right now, you feel that tugging on your heart. You know, right now, you hear that piano playing. Go ahead and turn that up a little bit. Hey, y'all feel what's going on here right now? Come on. Get up here right now. You want to get saved? Y'all feeling that pull right now on your heart as you hear that music as I point in your face and I tell you, get down here to the altar right now. Y'all feel that? Don't, don't you reject that. Boy, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Run to God and find mercy. Now's your chance, folks. You better get up here. You're going to walk out that door. You're going to forget all about this. The Holy Ghost isn't going to draw you anymore, and you ain't never going to be able to be saved. And by the way, we reject the reprobate doctrine. <laughs> uh, it, it, is, is that not the kind of foolishness that's going on? How many's ever experienced that before? And, the, and so what they, they, they call that the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, who isn't going to feel like going to an altar when a big old scary fat dude's up there saying, you better get out of here right now. Better get out of here right now. You're going to walk out of there. You're going to have a car wreck. And you're going to split hell wide open. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yes, every, every child in the building is being like, oh, man. I, I, I feel like you know, there's, there's, there's three people out there right now. The Holy Ghost told me there's three people. <laughs> This is their last chance. Is that you? Come on. You know, I need my music playing. You know, you know, is that you? Come on. We don't know. You don't know who that is. Right now, the Lord's telling somebody this is your last chance. You better do it. Or you don't, we don't boast not thyself of tomorrow thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You might... Live another 50 years, but it may be in a vegetative state where you're not able to call on the Lord because you got in a car wreck. You better get up here right now. Come on. All right, one more verse. One more verse. All right, let's start. Let's start. One more verse. I'm only gonna do. I'm only gonna do one more verse. <laughs> y'all, y'all know how it goes. That, and and they do that, telling you, you know, now's the time to do it. But here's the thing: a lot of times people are sitting out in the audience. And they have questions. They're like, well, wait a minute. Your sermon was really all over the place when it came to salvation. Do I have to give up my sins? You know, can I just believe? A lot of times they have questions. That's why we need to talk to them one-on-one -on -one so we can see where they're at. So we can, in, in fact, we need to talk to them so we can find out exactly what it is they need to repent of. Because some people are trusting in their works. Some people are trusting in another gospel or another God. There's, there's other, you know, what they have to repent of, it depends on what they are believing in. That's why we need one-on-one -on -one confrontation with these things. But they're going to go, they're going to get up, and they're going to preach some emotional message where they go all over the place. And then they're going to get up and they're going to read, you can't come except the Holy Ghost draw you. And then they will tell you that drawing is what you're feeling right now while the emotional music's going on. 
while they're pointing in your face, telling you to get to the altar, while they're telling you scary stories about people who walked out the door and died of a car, you know, in a car wreck, you know, ten, five minutes later and went to hell and they're burning there right now and you can, I can practically hear them screaming right now. That's going to be you. And they, they're telling you that is the drawing of the Holy Ghost. No, it's not. That is the drawing of the preacher. That's what that is. I mean, right now, I could use that same method. I could, you know, I can, I mean, I, said, I hate to play emotional games with people. I, I hate to, I don't like for people to know that I have this power and this ability. But, you know, right now, some of you right now, you're getting hungry right now. Y'all feel that in your stomach right there? It's getting close to lunchtime. <laughs> Some of y'all, it's been a while since you ate. Yeah, you got in a hurry this morning. You, di you, didn't, you didn't eat breakfast. And you're hungry. <laughs> right now, y'all feel that right now? Y'all feel that in, in, your, in your gullet? You know, you're hung that's hunger right there. You, know, you need to get that taken care of. Come take the bread of life. You know, you know, just, you know, these are emotional tactics that people are using, and they're calling it the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you right now are thinking, I'm hungry. All of a sudden, some of you right now are thinking about food and thinking, oh, nobody gets done pretty soon because we got to beat the Methodist to the chicken house. I'm getting hungry. That, that's what you're thinking right now. And anybody can use that type of, of tactic, manipulation. I mean, it's, it's sad. And the thing is, these guys, they get up there with that drawing of the Holy Spirit thing, and then they teach the reprobate doctrine. They literally teach the reprobate doctrine. They will use verses on the reprobate doctrine. And then... They get mad when you preach on the reprobate doctrine. It's like the only time you can become reprobate is when you don't come down to the old-fashioned altar during the camp meeting. You know, that, that's, when you come, that's when you become reprobate in their world. And the thing is, too, in this, in this post that I did, you know what one of the main verses people were bringing up? Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness to the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use of that which is against nature. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So what they're doing with that is they're saying, you know, that was that drawing of the Holy Spirit. That was that, you know, God revealed himself to them. And, that, and right there, they'll use that as proof of Holy Ghost conviction. Well, once again, yes, God does do that. God does reveal himself. He does it through the Holy Spirit. And when people reject, often they are given over to a reprobate mind. But once again, how is what this talking about resemble what's going on in churches today during their emotional altar calls? How is that? How, how, do we see that anywhere in there? Because that's the thing I'm trying to get out with these people. On, on, on one hand, their doctrine is accurate, but what they describe in their preaching is 10 miles off and confusing. And the thing is, these, it's, these guys do. They're preaching the reprobate doctrine. In reality, what they're doing is they're making walking to an old-fashioned altar in front of everyone a requirement for salvation. But some people often need questions answered because these guys aren't clear. You can't figure out. I mean, you go to the, you know, an average camp meeting church and you listen to that preacher preach salvation and you're not going to know. You're not going to know what you need to do. You won't have any idea. You're still going to get done. He's going to give his gospel presentation and you're still going to be saying, what must I do to be saved? Right. You're not going to know that's how all over the place these guys are. Oh, well, the Holy Ghost will reveal it to you. Now, what sins do I have to get rid of? Because I'm pretty sure you haven't gotten all rid of all your sins. Holy Ghost will tell you which ones. Well, you know, come on. I just want to get saved. <laughs> you know? So... And then, and then it's like, all right, all right fine, all right, I, I, I'll give up my sins. And, you know, maybe they, there's a few, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go throw my television out tonight, you know. I'll go throw, I'll do this, I'll do that. And so then they go forward, they pray. You know, Lord, I promise I'm going to give up my cussing. I'm going to give up my television. I'm going to give up everything in, in this life that I enjoy because I want to be saved. But then they go home and they can't bring themselves to throw their television away. They get mad and they cuss. 
And then you know what they do next year at the camp meeting? They have to go get saved again because I didn't really mean it. So, but do you all see how this is confusing people? How these guys are just all over the place? They, you know, they, need, they need to get this stuff. They need to clear this stuff up. They make John 16, 7 and 8 about repenting of sin instead of repenting of unbelief. They use, they use John 16, 7 and 8 to teach the no conviction, no conversion. Said, and like I said, well, on one hand, that statement is true, but they have turned it into heresy because they teach that, you know, you know, the contradiction of that you have to have this overwhelming feeling of guilt. And this is another thing. I listened to a guy one time. He preached a message on no conviction, no conversion. He got up in the sermon and he's telling you, man, if you've never been drawn, if you've never just had this basically emotional experience, I doubt your salvation. He got up and he's like, he's saying, you know, if you come to church on Sunday morning, we don't see you again until next Sunday morning. There's something wrong with that. And then he got up in that same service and he was telling them not to trust in their emotional decisions that they made at the youth conference and things like that. And I'm thinking, well, you just told them in your last point that if they didn't have any emotion, there's something wrong with that. And now you're telling them because they got emotional... There's probably something wrong because, you know, y'all know you can't trust yourself and you're emotional. Well, exactly. But explain to me now, how in the world can I know I'm saved? And, the, and that guy literally at the end of his message, he had church members coming up and getting saved. Literally, church members were going up there and getting saved probably for the 14th time. You know, where it's, I think that's how they keep their salvation numbers up and their baptisms up. If they were only allowed to count people once, they'd have zero people saved a year. <laughs> Z literally zero people saved a year except for like the new five-year-old that got saved but just you know give it time he'll get saved six or seven more times there's no doubt about that but you know they're so the, you know they're all over the place they the same people tell them they'll tell them you know, don't follow your emotional decision you made at teen camp they'll use verses like acts 9 5 to prove their dramatic story. This one got used, Acts 9, 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. All right, now what does that mean right there? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I'll tell you what it is. It's that prick that you're feeling right now. It's that, you know, that, you know, you know what you feel inside your heart, that moving that's going on, that's the Holy Spirit pricking you. He's trying, he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to tell you, give up that sin. You know? And they'll, just, they'll go into all these weird things, just real vague, real general, just confusing people. You know, not all stories are going to be a dramatic one. You know, my story of when I got saved, it's not a dramatic story. I grew up in a preacher's home. I got saved at a young age. I wasn't out riding on my horse after, on my way to go kill a man that cheated me in a deal. I didn't almost get struck by lightning. My gun didn't get struck by lightning. Anybody know what I'm talking about right there? I didn't go walking into a church full of people singing the old-time religion. Uh, Alvin York. Anybody? Nobody's ever seen Alvin York. Uh, Brother Mark, all right, some, brother, they, they've seen it. All right, that's what happens in Sergeant York. You know, I didn't go walking up the aisle while all the church surrounded me as I went to the altar. and then uh, that, I don't have a story like that. And you have these young people... They don't have dramatic stories like that. And they go to these meetings where these preachers get up there. I mean, their specialty is getting up and telling everybody their dramatic story. They, you know, they all got saved out of a life of drugs and you know, crime and all these things. And they go everywhere telling their story. Make it, and they often make kids doubt their salvation. Let me tell you when I got saved, I gave up all my sins. I dumped my friends. I never wanted to smoke again. I never wanted to do anything. You, know, you guys... Y'all are trying to get into what I got saved out of. Something wrong with that? Well, now here's, here's what, why they're doing that. It's because they're made out of the same flesh you are made out of. You know from experience that a life of sin is no life to be enjoyed. You've learned from experience that it brings misery and sorrow. They are being deceived by the devil right now. They're being deceived by the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And they are always going to have that. Even Jesus, he, had, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. But what did the devil use with Jesus? He used the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
Now, Jesus did the right thing, but even Jesus was tempted. And so if Jesus, if the sinless Son of God was tempted, then why wouldn't we who are sinful be tempted too, even if we're saved? We will be tempted. The problem with these kids, it's not that they're not saved. It's just that they're dealing with temptation. You know what they need to learn? They need to learn some character. They need to learn some discipline. They need to learn how to walk in the Spirit so they will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They don't need to go and get saved again. But that's what's happening. These kids, they hear that stuff and they're like, man, I was just, you know, I was planning on doing this. I was, or I just did this the other day. You know, I watched this on the internet. I did whatever. And you know what they do? They go and they get saved again thinking, now I won't want to do those things anymore. Now, you know, I'll be that new creature. Now I'll never, you know, I'll never want to sin again. But folks, it's, they're still going to have the same flesh. We still have the same flesh. And they, they just need to learn to trust in Christ. They, they, need, you know, they just need to be thank, and they need to learn how to walk in the Spirit so they don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then everything will be fine. But we're always going to have the flesh to deal with. And so the main problem with all these pastors is that they're not being clear in their teaching they're causing confusion. And not only that, and this is the thing that just upsets me about it greatly, they use this trash teaching to question soul winning and to be down on soul winning. Uh, you ain't telling me these people are getting a Holy Ghost conviction in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Why not? Truth is, maybe the Holy Ghost already has revealed to them their sin. Do you realize most people know that they're sinners? Do you realize most people in this area have been in church of some kind? And they know they're sinners, but you know what? No one's ever told them that you can know that you're saved. They're all walking around saying, well, I hope I'm saved. You know, that's what they usually say. Well, I mean, hey, if you die today, do you know if you go to heaven? Well, I hope so. They want to know. They've already been convinced that they're sinners. All we're doing is bringing them the good news. Here's the good news. Your sins have been paid for. You can know that you're saved. You can have eternal life right now. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be worthy of it. You just have to accept it by faith. They can get that in 10 minutes. But they're, but they're saying, nope, you got to have Holy Ghost conviction. Well, if they've been convinced that they're sinners, they had Holy Ghost conviction. That's all there is to it, right? They, they've had it. Oh, you can't come except Father draw you. As if you can only have drawing when the piano's playing. One of these days I'm going to do it. We'll be talking about doing a, a camp meeting soul winning video. All right? Like what it would look like if camp meeting preachers went soul winning. And the way I'm going to do it is while we're, you know, giving the guy the gospel, when it gets going really good, all of a sudden piano music is going to start playing. We're going to have like a piano there at their house. You know, cause like you can't get saved in their world without the piano music. And, you know, and I'm not going to go as far as they would. It'd be better too, if we had, you know, a girl's trio singing, I surrender all and crying, you know, while that was going on too, that would, that would be much better and more effective. We could do that. But they, they think they, cause that's what they think drawing is. So once again, the, the concept of, you know, the, the fact that you have to have Holy Ghost conviction is true. Yes, you can't come except the Holy Spirit draw you, but what they are describing as Holy Ghost conviction is not Holy Ghost conviction. That is not what it is. It's mama guilt that they're putting on people in many cases. It's just, it's pure emotion. And folks, right now, I mean, I mean, I had some of you wanting to come to the altar just by playing that I Surrender All. You've been programmed o over the years. You've been programmed. Some of you almost got up out of your seat. I, I could see it. Maybe it's because you do need to get out of your seat. <laughs> Maybe we better have an altar call after this service. I, I, know, I, saw, I, saw, I, saw you, I saw some of you hanging on to that pew. Well, you just need to find a time, high time you just sur surrender to the Holy Ghost and you let go of that pew. Come down, come down this altar. I wouldn't wait until the music starts. You know, invitation, it's all the time, folks. You know, altars are always open. You know, don't wait. The Holy Ghost might stop moving by the time the preaching gets done. Preacher might start making fun of southern preachers and getting in the flesh and quench the Holy Spirit. And then he's going to be done drawing you. You're not going to be able to come get saved at that point. So I, I hope I've illustrated this, that I 
believe in Holy Ghost conviction. I believe it is necessary for salvation. I believe in the scriptures on these things, but I believe what is presented and is being put forth as Holy Ghost conviction is in fact a fraud. And I believe it is of the flesh, and I believe it is only causing confusion in many cases for saved people, and in other cases, giving a false assurance of salvation for lost people who are still lost. And we've got, to, we've got to watch out for that. We've got to learn to be biblical in our definitions. And you know what? No verse that anyone gave on that post described anything emotional like I've been talking about. But I dare you to tell me that I am misrepresenting. All right? You know I am not misrepresenting today, that I am accurately portraying that crowd, I know I'm like the back of my hand. And I wish, like I said, I've been, I've been publicly down in the camp meeting crowd to the point now, I'm afraid to show my face at camp meetings, and I don't like that. But I feel like stuff has needed to be said, you know, it needed to be said, and so I'm willing to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did it, but I miss going to camp meetings and watching that foolishness. It was always a great exhibition, and it gave me a lot of good sermon material. But... And I, I hope this was a help to you today. So with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that does comfort us, that does convict us. And Lord, I pray you'll help us to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We, we thank you that, uh, that you live inside us and you help guide us, that you help keep us away from sin. And I pray you'll help us to be people who walk in the Spirit so we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I pray you'll um, help preachers to just to get right on this subject and to stop... Um, Using, uh, using the Bible in a twisted way and making it mean things that it doesn't just to confuse people on their salvation. Help them to realize that salvation is simple, it's free, and help them to let people enjoy it. Maybe they'd actually be willing to go out and tell others about your free gift. And pray a bless everyone uh, this afternoon. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Our final song, go to page 200.